So I will share my uh, screen with you. Um, here it is. I guess you can all see my screen now. Please give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Great. Yes. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this workshop on. Oh, sorry, it's going too fast. Uh, here it is. Never mind. I'll start again. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this workshop on using experiments to fight science's information online, an evidence-based guide. Let me present the panel and the agenda for today, as well as the general tone for this workshop. Um, my name is Carlo Martini, and I teach philosophy of science, critical thinking, and communication to philosophers, psychologists, and uh, medical students at Vita Saluta San Raffaele University, UNISR for short. Um, Folko uh, Panizza is a cognitive scientist and postdoctoral researcher at the University at UNISR. Uh, Piero Ronzani is an experimental economist at the same university, and the three of us are part of the Horizon 2020 project Peritia, Policy, Expertise and Trust, a European consortium to study and foster trust in policy and expertise. I will tell you what our specific team does very shortly, but first let me introduce our guest speaker here today. John Cook is a research fellow at the Climate Change Communication Research Hub at Monash University. Uh, he has won a number of awards for his science communication efforts. I mentioned the Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the Advancement of Climate Change Knowledge and the 2016 Friend of the Planet Award. He has written books and papers on climate, climate change denialism, and on the scientific consensus behind climate change. He is here today because he will present to us the topic of gamification, a very useful tool to fight disinformation and promote critical thinking. He is the creator of a very popular app um, called Cranky Uncle that, uh, and I quote from the website, uses cartoons and critical thinking to fight misinformation. But I won't be giving you any spoilers uh, and I'll let you enjoy his presentation very shortly. Instead, what I want to do here briefly in the next 10 minutes is to present to you the work that me and my team are doing with the Peritia Research Project. So um, let me start with um, a truism. Uh, it may be a truism, it may seem obvious, but I think it's not. Fake news is not the same as scientific disinformation. Now, this is an example of fake news. The infamous Pizzagate conspiracy theory that circulated in 2016. And this is an example of uh, scientific disinformation. It refers to a long running point of contention about the health of polar bears habitat as a proxy for the health of the Arctic environment. There are, of course, many differences between the two examples, but two are the ones that I'd like you to focus on. Now, it's common for fake news, I mean, not always, but I think often enough, uh, to have no legs, okay? They are completely baseless and a little bit of digging can be effective for debunking them. Well, not so for scientific disinformation. Scientific disinformation has a solid evidential basis in pseudoscience and pseudo expertise. That is, pseudoscience provides the bogus evidence for scientific disinformation to thrive. Uh, I like to represent the infosphere of scientific disinformation as the branches of a tree that has roots in pseudoscience. In fact, there is even some research that shows that a large number of posts and articles in media and social media are based on a small number of individuals and sources that look scientific and that present themselves as scientific, but for a variety of reasons that range from greed to ideology or just plain credulity are methodological unsound and um, unscientific. Now, the second difference between um, fake news and scientific disinformation is that even with a good level of education, scientific disinformation is much harder to recognize. Understanding whether a piece of science related and science looking information is reliable or not with certainty requires technical competence that the lay person lacks. Again, I like to represent the epistemic um, environment of scientific information at, as 
and sorry, <laughs> this information as follows. In the infosphere, there are clearly identifiable experts on the one hand, and on the other hand, clearly identifiable non-experts, okay, people who are not experts. I think almost anyone would recognize that my um, car mechanic is not an expert on climate change matters. But in between these two categories of people, there is a third group of people with a variety of backgrounds and motivations that look like experts to the untrained eye, but are really non-experts, or at any rate, their expert judgment is compromised. I like to call them the wolves in sheep's clothing with a, I think, very um, useful metaphor. Now, this third group of people is what allows scientific disinformation to thrive and what provides the roots to, the most, to most of the disinformation we find in blogs, uh, social media, as well as, unfortunately, traditional media. So here you have some examples. Going back to the article I showed you before, you will find several examples on the web referring to one main source which is the work by an ex-researcher at the University of Victoria, an anthropologist who regularly publishes on polar bears. Now, I won't take the role of the debunker here. We can debate any particular example. I just want to show you that there, are, there is a whole world of um, pseudoscience underpinning scientific disinformation. So here are some examples. You can really choose your topic and, and you'll find some examples. Um, uh, cholesterol and statins, okay? Statins are a class of drugs to fight cholesterol. Um, CO2 emissions, uh, polar bears, as I just mentioned, uh, homeopathy, uh, vaccines, of course, and uh, again, vaccines. You'll find lots of examples of pseudoscience on vaccines, okay? And this is the slide that maybe I like the most because it's actually not my slide. It's a slide I got from an Italian doctor. His name is Riccardo Caccialanza. And I met him at the Congress on Pancreatic Cancer. I was presenting on pseudoscience and disinformation and he was presenting on oncological nutrition. By the way, if you have cancer, nutrition is very important. This is what I learned. He showed me this slide and told me that the serious problem for his profession as a doctor assisting oncological patient is the huge amount of fad diets and other pseudoscientific information circulating among patients and sometimes worsening their already fragile condition. So what is uh, the role of our project, okay, in all of this? Well, we are part of a European consortium of universities headed by the amazing uh, Maria Bagramian, you see her in, in the picture, at University College Dublin. And we study information, disinformation, expertise, and trust. The uh, sub-project and the team that I have the honor of directing in Milan uh, is working on behavioral tools for building trust. We believe that trust is very important for science, uh, but people should place their trust wisely. People should trust the trustworthy. Well, how can we achieve that? How can we teach people to trust the trustworthy? Um, we know that this information affects both beliefs and behavior. Uh, our project or sub-project targets both. But for this workshop and for the reasons, for reasons of time, we will focus here on beliefs. Our goal is to devise intervention targeting scientific disinformation because this information affects trust in science and in experts. Nothing new so far. This is what many news outlets, groups, and even social media have been trying to do. In particular, in the past few years, there has been an acceleration of this kind of activity for, I think, obvious reasons. But how do we do this with our research group? Well, we design experiments, social experiments. Well, why experiments? We think that interventions should be evidence-based um, to save financial resources, for example, by focusing on what actually works and to gain democratic legitimations of policies that work. So by running an intervention in an experiment, we can prove effectiveness. Uh, in order to gain knowledge rather than just going with a guesswork and uh, in order to have good selling points also to media outlets and policymakers. 
Now, this is the work that uh, Folko Panitsa um, will tell you all about it in, um, in a little bit. But before that, we have a couple of things to do. So in the next um, 10 minutes or so, Piero, Piero Ronzani will let you play, will present to you first and let you play, you participants, a role playing game. Okay, Piero will introduce this in a moment. Um, after that, John Cook will talk to you about using games to fight disinformation. Then um, Folco will uh, present to you the results from our own experiments, uh, our team. And finally, we will have, um, I think about 20 to 25 minutes of discussion time for your own questions and comments. So without further ado, let me now give the floor to Piero. Uh, he will present to you this role-playing game. So start thinking about what would you do if you were the policymakers. Piero, please. Uh, thank you, Carlo. Um, so hi, everybody. I see there are uh, about 30 people uh, now in the, uh, in the workshop. Uh, what we ask you to do is to, you're going to be splitted in, uh, in groups through breakout rooms. And uh, we're going to give you the link in a few seconds about um, this uh, uh, Google form. And uh, your task will be to choose one, uh, one person uh, that will fill the, the form for the group and to submit, uh, discuss and submit the, the form. Uh, as Carla was saying, what we ask you to do is put yourself in the shoes of a policymaker. And uh, this is the, the example. So you're going to see a Facebook post containing some uh, uh, pseudo scientific information. And what you have to do is to come up with a strategy to help people, help internet user to detect this fake news. And the rules of the game is that the intervention should be online. It should be uh, as cost effective as possible. And, uh, um, and that's it, only, only this. Okay, so now I ask Folko to write, yeah, I already put uh, the link of the Google form in the chat. And in a few seconds, we're gonna, you're gonna be redirected to uh, different breakout rooms. And after you complete the form, we, uh, I ask you to come back to the main, uh, uh, to the main Zoom room. Let me just add, uh, we just need one form per group and, uh... So yeah, you don't need to all fill the, the form. I'll just now uh, divide you into uh, two rooms. So now you should see the rooms. So 10 minutes for this, we will reserve 10 minutes. So um, I hope you enjoyed this little um, role-playing game. Now, Folko will, uh, sorry, Piero will do the work in the background and have a look at um, your answers and ideas. And there will be a debriefing in about uh, 20 minutes or a bit less. But now let me give the floor to John Cook for his presentation. John, please. Great, we can see your screen now. We cannot uh, hear you though. You need to mute. You're still muted. I lost the unmute button, sorry. Now we hear you as well. A year of Zooming and I still forget to unmute myself. It's so embarrassing. Okay, so um, I'm going to very quickly talk about two um, studies that I've published on this, the whole theme of this. Um, workshop about using experiments and collecting empirical evidence to inform um, effective ways to counter misinformation. Uh, and then that will, um, both those studies have really been the foundation for, for my work using gamification as a tool against misinformation. The first study um, I conducted uh, during my PhD, and it was about uh, using inoculation to counter misinformation. Uh, and in this study, I ran an experiment where I showed people some misinformation about climate change. And the misinformation was taken um, uh, verbatim from a website, the Global Warming Petition Project. Uh, the misinformation is actually a bit 
quite similar to the example that we just used in our, um, our breakout rooms. Uh, and so I showed people this misinformation and, and then I measured the effect that it had on people who were just shown the misinformation. And this is what I found. I found that people uh, exposed to climate misinformation um, had a reduced um, or perceived consensus and a lot of other climate attitudes, acceptance of global warming, support for climate action. Basically, cl climate misinformation had a negative impact, but uh, not the same across everyone across the population. The horizontal axis in this graph is political ideology. And I found that people who were politically conservative were affected more than people who were politically liberal. Um, uh, and so what that tells us is that misinformation, or climate misinformation at least, is, has a polarizing effect. Uh, it splits the public apart. So that they end up further apart in their beliefs after being exposed to misinformation. Uh, with another group in my experiment, um, I showed them some uh, an inoculating message first before I showed them the misinformation. And this is an excerpt of the inoculating message. Uh, and it doesn't mention the Global Warming Petition Project at all. Instead, what I talked about was a technique used in misinformation called fake experts, which is basically using people who convey the impression of expertise without actually possessing the relevant expertise as a way to cast out on an expert consensus. Uh, and so here's a little a brief explanation of the fake expert strategy. I use uh, tobacco misinformation as an example, but I never actually mentioned the Global Warming Petition Project. Uh, even so, I found that inoculating people about this general technique of misinformation before showing them the climate misinformation uh, neutralized the misinformation. The blue line here is the inoculated group and um, the change in their climate perceptions after being shown both the inoculation and the misinformation. Uh, and even though there's a slight slope to the line, statistically, it's equivalent to a, a horizontal line. Uh, what I found was the misinformation was completely neutralized across the political spectrum. And so this really tells us two things. Firstly, uh, nobody likes being misled, whether you're politically conservative or liberal, when you explain the techniques used to mislead, that can neutralize the misinformation. Um, uh, even polarizing misinformation that people's, uh, uh, people are, um, I guess, predisposed to believe, uh, as is the case with political conservatives and climate misinformation, at least in the US. Uh, secondly, you can inoculate people against misinformation without even mentioning it by explaining the general techniques used to mislead. After this research, then we started exploring, well, how do you put that into practice? What are some uh, engaging ways to, um, to inoculate people against techniques of denial? And I published some research with some of my colleagues at George Mason University, So Jun Kim and Emily Draga, where we tested both um, humorous and non-humorous ways of inoculating people and explaining the techniques of misinformation. Uh, the example we used was vaccine misinformation. Uh, and this was a non-humorous debunking or correction uh, in the context of Twitter. Uh, and you see here the, um, a, a basically a critical thinking approach explaining the fallacy in the misinformation. The alternative approach, the humorous approach, used a cartoon to explain exactly the same thing, the fallacy in the misinformation, specifically the technique of parallel argumentation, take the logical flaw in misinformation and transplant it into a parallel absurd situation. And we found that both approaches were equally effective. The humorous and the non-humorous both were uh, effective in debunking the misinformation and reducing belief in the myth that vaccines cause harm. Um, and then we uh, used uh, mediation analysis just to explore why were they effective and were they effective in different ways. And we found that the non-humorous uh, correction was effective because it had higher credibility while the cartoon was effective because it attracted people's attention more. 
And so what this research tells us is there is no one magic bullet or one strategy for correcting misinformation. Different strategies work, um, but they work through different pathways. Uh, but the interesting thing about the cartoon condition was people were also more likely to share it, to uh, comment and like it, and also humorous corrections we found increased people's information seeking. They want to know more about the topic after reading that. Uh, and so that leads me to, I hope I've not gone too long. I've got, can I, have I got two or three more minutes, hopefully? Okay, so, great. Yes, so, so three, three more minutes, yes, go ahead. That's perfect. So that leads me to like the last thing, talking about gamification. A big challenge for me was these are all the different techniques of denial that you would need to explain to people in order to fully inoculate them against all the different flavors of misinformation. And that landscape, all that information is an education and communication challenge. How do you get people to internalize all that information and all those techniques? Uh, and what I found was gamification was a really powerful and engaging tool to achieve exactly that. So over the last couple of years, we've been developing the game Cranky Uncle, which has the purpose of trying to inoculate players against uh, the techniques of denial by getting them to play through this game and learn the techniques of denial as if they're, they're becoming a Cranky Uncle themselves. So as they play the game, uh, Cranky Uncle mentors them on, on all the different ways that he denies science. And I used lots of cartoon parallel arguments to use cartoon analogies to explain all the different fallacies. Uh, but most importantly, the game gets you practicing critical thinking. It shows you examples of misinformation and you have to try to identify what is the technique of denial or the fallacy in each example. And by doing that over and over and over again, the game incentivizes you to practice critical thinking uh, and internalize all these different techniques. Uh, and the further you get into the game, the quicker and easier it is to spot misinformation. In other words, become more resilient against um, the misleading techniques in science denial. Uh, one last thing, we're um, in the process now of translating the game, which is currently only available in English. Uh, and we're I'm just starting to translate it in different languages. French, uh, sorry, German is the first language with, as our test. And then we're going, once that's ironed out all the wrinkles with the process, then we're going to start opening it up to other languages. So anyone interested in uh, volunteering to help us with translations, just go to the URL at the top of this slide. Uh, and lastly, if you want to have a look at the game, you can play it on iPhone, Android, or on browsers. So it's a free, uh, freely available game. Anyone can play it as long as you have internet access. So feel free to follow those URLs. And I'll stop there and, and hand it back to, um, to Carlo, I think. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the extremely interesting presentation. Everyone loves uh, cartoons and games. So maybe that will be the future of uh, fighting scientific disinformation. And I'm sure everyone is already uh, has already their phones in their hands uh, and are downloading the, the app or going to the browser. So <laughs> thank you again. Uh, now, let me introduce to you um, Folko Panizza again. He's a um, cognitive scientist, and now he will talk to you about uh, our own um, research at uh, Vita Salute San Rafael University, what, what we've been doing. Uh, regarding um, science's information and how to uh, help people um, trust the trustworthy. Folko, please go ahead. Thank you, Carlo. Um, and of course, thank you, John. Um, so here I'm going to be briefly presenting some of the results of one of our experiments uh, concerning also the activity of the, of the form that you just filled. And um, so I, I show you what we try to do, uh, uh, like placing ourselves in, in the shoes of a uh, uh, policymaker. And uh, so let's start with uh, giving you some background. So we try to follow two uh, strains of, uh, of intervention of, of proposals. Uh, one is coming from actually historians. 
There's this research that was carried out in uh, Stanford a few years back where they asked um, several professional historians and students uh, from faculty and as well as fact checkers to evaluate to uh, pediatric associations that had both appeared as quite legitimate, but where in fact one was actually a professional, professional association and the other uh, like conservative ad advocacy group. And what they found was that fact checkers overwhelmingly were able to pinpoint which was which of the two sources was the, was the more reliable, and uh, by exploring the strategies these fact checkers used, uh, the researchers distilled uh, a sort of a list of uh, strategies that are helpful to evaluate uh, unknown sources, which they uh, uh, called uh, civic online reasoning. And what we tried to test in our experiment, in particular, are two of these techniques. One being uh, so-called lateral reading, which is the idea that when you're browsing information online, you generally stop reading on a page and try to find out whatever you, you can find within the same page. But there's also another way of looking for information that is to read on several tabs and so look for information on other websites. And uh, click restraint, which is the idea that uh, when we're looking for information on a search engine, we uh, need uh, also not to stop at first results because the way the search results are ranked and organized does not meet the truth uh, requirement because uh, we don't know what uh, are the rankings for a single search engine. So we'd, we'd rather need to browse further than the first results. And so this was one approach that we tested. And at the same time, we wanted to test another idea, uh, which is the attention-based account, which su suggests that people should be able to uh, evaluate uh, scientific information if they're given uh, the, the tools, the not, not the tools, but rather the motivation. So people who deliberate more and pay more attention to the content will be less likely to believe false content. And uh, an example of this type of research uh, is, for instance, this experiment where uh, researchers sent a message on several thousand Twitter users and basically they sent this heading which was referencing to accuracy. The content of the message was not relevant. The important part was that users were reading the heading. And so they had in, their, in the back of their head, the idea of accuracy. And what these researchers found was that uh, compared to previous, uh, to before receiving the message, uh, these users were, uh, sharing more reliable sources and sharing less uh, unreliable sources according to uh, uh, fact checkers uh, ratings. So these two uh, proved somehow to be effective in the literature and we wanted to compare them. And the first thing that we tried to do was to design a message that appeared before the, the stimuli, which were Facebook posts like the one in the form. And the, that presented the techniques uh, that I mentioned before, so lateral reading and click restraint. So giving some tips on how to uh, look for information. And this is actually the very pop-up they see uh, before seeing the post. And on the other hand, we try to modulate attention and motivation through in monetary incentives. So participants in the experiment were paid to evaluate how scientifically valid, how accurate was the post. And some participants were actually uh, uh, given this additional incentive that if they actually answered correctly, their payment would be doubled. So we reasoned that paying participants to be accurate would increase the motivation to evaluate the content and thus the attention spent on it. Okay, so let's get to the results and uh, how much people actually use uh, lateral reading. So they, they search uh, for information on other website and click restraint. So looking further on in search engines. And uh, here are the results from our experiment. Uh, these bars represent where people search. So yellow bar is the article uh, behind the post, the search engine, uh, the website of the article, the Facebook page of the website and so forth. Uh, what we see is that very few people actually engage in uh, uh, searching on the search engine, which we uh, define as our measure of lateral reading, and even, even less actually uh, 
uh, don't stop at the first results, which is the dark brown uh, bar within. So people who look into Google, for instance, not all of them uh, look further on. Uh, this is the baseline where no intervention was used. And then what we find is that, for instance, pain participants, to be accurate, does somehow increase uh, by a slight margin the use of uh, these techniques and therefore the, the search on, on different uh, on different websites and particular search engines. And more, uh, more remarkably, we, when they're presented actually with a pop-up, as you can see here. And uh, we also try to uh, combine these two interventions and we see that uh, there is somehow a, a linear uh, addition of these two effects. And uh, so there is also uh, benefits in using these two types of uh, techniques together. Okay, uh, but let's get also to the actually uh, ability of participants to recognize uh, scientific uh, fake news or legitimate uh, scientific information. And what we observe is that uh, using these two techniques together on average, increases uh, users' capability of recognizing information by 6.5%. And, uh, and in general, using the civic online reasoning techniques uh, has leads to an, an advantage of around 8%. So that being said, we tested this on several uh, different uh, Facebook posts, one being the example that we gave you on the form. Uh, but what we see is for, for this specific example is that, uh, first of all, the uh, effectiveness of this intervention varies uh, considerably from post to post. It depends on several features like the, the source, the appearance, the prior beliefs. And uh, for this given post, for instance, the incentive, uh, the monetary incentives were uh, actually effective, but not presenting the, uh, the fact-checking techniques. In fact, people who uh, actually went on Google and searched for information, uh, or DuckDuckGo, whatever research, uh, search engine you're using, actually did score less uh, accurately than participants who did not. Overall, what we observe is that what the maximum effect of these interventions is when they are combined, meaning people are motivated to look for information and somehow have the tools they're presented with these techniques. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, we see that both monetary incentives and civic online reasoning tips seem to be uh, effective on average in increasing the evaluation of uh, scientific posts. Uh, but we see that there's a significant variability uh, when using a search engine to evaluate information. And we have uh, many suspects uh, for, this, uh, for this factor. One thing is that people don't search uh, deep enough into the results. And even when they report uh, uh, using click restraint, they probably still biased by the search algorithm. Another factor that we actually have some evidence of is that uh, prior biases uh, affect their searches. So if they find the content plausible, they will still have a bias in, in looking for the results. And also the most important point is that uh, these techniques are, are meant to be learned in a, in a span of time rather than just being presented for a few seconds on a screen. So that's also something that we will look forward to explore with more extensive interventions. And with that, I would like to thank you and uh, Yes, I'll, I'll Great. Leave thank you, the... Folko. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and uh, so now we have uh, a bit less than, than half an hour, let's say 25 minutes left. Um, uh, Piero has gone through your um, ideas for how to um, help people become debunkers in a sense. So we, we, now he will present to you um, the results that you have created yourself, and then we will have time for discussion. Um, Piero, do you think uh, five minutes is enough? Yeah, yeah, I can do it. I can stretch. Great. Uh, so thank you for your uh, your answer. While you were listening to the presenter, I was rushing at doing some some very basic analysis, um, and uh, I'm gonna share now. Um, the results. Uh, let me put 
Okay, you should see it full screen now, right? Okay, so um, so here are the results. Uh, as you see, the the technique that has been the, the, the type of intervention that has been chosen by the majority of the groups is to work on techniques. So something that has to do with uh, what we uh, Folko presented. Uh, so the idea that you you expose people to techniques that then are helpful to uh, fat check. Uh, the second, and then we have one group each that say that uh, uh, is going to use the banking, uh, work and focus and attention. Where focus and attention are similar, but focus is more about what the person is uh, paying uh, attention at. While attention is the general idea that you are more vigilant while while doing the. Uh, your judgment. So here are the things you uh, you mentioned. Uh, one group said work with social media platform. Um, the same is exposed with the opposite message, saying that the climate change is an emergency. Uh, board of scientists who can act to intervene with enough funding to judge scientific information, counter propaganda. So it's more um, a, a list of things, a list of possible intervention that might have might have an, uh, uh, might help. Um, we have uh, another group is say add fact checking warning where people can click to get uh, correct information, and this is what Facebook and Twitter are kind of doing in reality. So putting uh, a sort of pop up when the 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 topic is particularly relevant with a possibility for people to, to get uh, verified information. Um, here, a bit more a cryptic um, answer. So the, the UN as scientists as well, maybe in the discussion, you can um, tell us what, what you refer uh, to with this. And um, source agenda of the source, what is the scientist background? So this idea of verifying the credibility of the uh, the scientist. Um, and again, here, check the expert. Are they expert? Um, and what are the interests? So to, to, to show whether there is a conflict of interest behind and, and to check whether the expert is a real expert. And lastly, uh, there is one, this design, use a Paluni detector kit for checking such news, contextualize the post by showing other contradictory messages based on recommender system. So this idea of this lateral reading, but in, a, in an automatic way. Uh, so very, very cool um, ideas from, from you. Um, talking about the costs, and this is just, I mean, we put this question just to make you uh, think about the fact that when you plan uh, an online intervention, it's very important that you think about the cost effectiveness of this intervention. And uh, it can go to, so some groups say zero, but the idea is that when you do an online intervention, it might be extremely cheap and this can be easily scalable or it can be more costly. And then you need to think about, is this cost worth to pay in terms of the fact that you can uh, you can achieve with that, and um, last things I want to mention. So here is the rank. Uh, so the category has been when we ask at the end, which is the type of intervention you think will be more effective, emotion and pre-banking. So the idea of exposing before uh, the, the people to the to the type of bias. Uh, are scoring first. And this is interesting because nobody then choose an emotional intervention. So maybe this is something we should uh, consider more and, um, and work more on. Even with our project, we don't, we don't have a specific emotional intervention. Uh, and then focus, techniques, debunking, motivation, and attention. And uh, something interesting is that uh, talking about techniques and motivation, those are, we have a test for this, right? And in our test kind of contradict this ranking, this prediction, because motivation through this um, uh, monetary incentive is beating techniques as a, you know, as a magnitude of the result, as a, as a positive impact. And this, if we have a take home message for this is that we really need experiments because intuition 
is not enough. We really need to test and see what is working better. Um, and with this, I thank you. And uh, I think I leave the floor to Carlo again. Great. Thank you, Piero. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I really like the last message in a sense. I mean, it's of course, we cannot do without intuitions. Uh, whenever we act in, in uh, you know, if we apply a policy in, in Italy or in the US or in Australia, we need intuitions because we need to go locally. However, if these intuitions stay in the, um, you know, tacit knowledge box, um, well, we cannot really know whether our intuitions are good or not. And that's why, um, well, John has run experiments and um, we have run experiments to try to understand actually what works and what can really be effective. Mm -hmm.